good evening and welcome to everybody. Um, I should explain, for those who haven't realized how this is sort of formatted, that we are in a sort of interregnum between the annual statutory meeting, beginning of, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is for fellows only, this public gathering, and then if you will permit us, well I think even if you won't permit us it's going to happen anyhow, um, we go back to the business of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which is I expire and hand over to the new, the new president. Um, you have had your fire warning. I, I explained to the annual statutory meeting earlier today that um, every meeting I talked about the um, fire alarm and what you do. Only this morning did I realise that when there is an actual fire alarm practice in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, which there was for real this morning, it is a sign that the president is about to hand over. Once every three years it happens. No, serious. Oh, you've got the fire alarm. Right. What I wanted to do was take this opportunity really to, to reflect uh, on some experience with, with, with Hong Kong and China and how things have changed over the years in, in the course of my own involvement with, with Hong Kong and China and maybe some thoughts about um, what this means for all of us and then leave things open to, to questions and pick up any points that people have both from here and there are people in the overflow upper gallery. It's 14 years now since the sovereignty over Hong Kong was transferred from, from Britain to uh, back to, to China. But I want to look before that to a period of really fundamental change in, in both Hong Kong and China. Because not 14 years, but um, rather longer since I first became involved with Hong Kong and China. I realized this um, in August when I was invited to go back to Hong Kong to take part in the centenary celebrations uh, as one of the speakers of Hong Kong University. And I realized that it was actually 50 years since I had been a student at Hong Kong University. In other words, my lifespan had been half that of the centenary of the university. It, it was quite a serious moment. <laughs> now, the other thing that really struck me was how enormously Hong Kong had changed in those 50 years. I went there 50 years ago as a student. I went in the old-fashioned way. I went so old-fashioned that I went from Saigon, um, not even Ho Chi Minh City, by Massagerie Maritime Liner, through that great gap, the Liner and Gap, into Hong Kong Harbour. Sides of the hills on both sides, as you went in, were covered with squatter housing because Hong Kong was still uh, suffering under the pressure of a massive influx of refugees from mainland China. My teachers, because I was learning Mandarin in, in the Cantonese-speaking area, my teachers were all refugees from northern China. They had the extraordinary experience as Chinese of um, not being able to speak Cantonese. And so in a shop they were obliged to speak English, and the Cantonese shopkeepers thought they were being terribly uppity in refusing to speak Chinese. And the only reason was they spoke the wrong dialect. But it was a very, very different place. Um, it, it wasn't totally a backwater, but it was a backwater compared to what it is now. The new territories were still paddy fields. The great new cities, Shatin or the other ones that people will know, hadn't even started. Um, it was a very, very different place. The university was, it was all right, but I don't think you would classify it as one of the great universities of, of the world. The population was three million, and at least half of that population was under the age of 25. I did two years of study at, at the University of Hong Kong. It was a wonderful time to be there. It's a wonderful place to study in those days because you work for about three hours or four hours in the morning. And then you were allowed free. You had a list of maybe 30 characters to learn each day. And you could go up onto the hills and just watch the Pearl River Delta expand in front of you and learn your characters. Or you could go down to the seaside, empty beaches, and you'd write characters in the sand. And the waves would wash them out when you made mistakes and you started again. It, it was a wonderful place to be a student. China was very, very different. 1963, early 1963, not very long after the collapse of that 
dramatically awful period of the Great Leap Forward before the next dramatically awful period of the Cultural Revolution. It was grey. Everything was grey. The first night I arrived in February, um, I got on a bicycle and cycled around Peking at about nine o'clock at night. The city was dead, hardly anybody there. Street lights dim, just, just sort of shining little pools of light. Um, it, it was almost an agricultural city keeping agricultural time. People were dressed in, in, in Mao suits, Mao jackets. The markets were empty and on the street sides there were people selling cabbages and, and things like that. Very little in the, in, in the way of food. Everything was going on behind the walls of Old Peking, these grey walls with the uh, narrow lanes and activity going on behind it. As a foreigner, I was a diplomatic foreigner, we were limited to 20 kilometers around the center of Peking. At the end of each 20 kilometers, there was a notice in Chinese and English saying, no foreigners beyond this point. We could go to certain cities uh, with permission, uh, you couldn't go anywhere else. The first weekend I was there, um, I put in an application to the Foreign Ministry Protocol people as you had to, saying, uh, I've always wanted to go to what are called the Western Hills of Peking, which you've just seen in the distance, because I knew from reading all the books that there were wonderful temples up there, and it was just outside our area. No reply, which was a usual thing, rang up uh, on the Friday night and said, um, I haven't had a reply. Um, you know, I really do love climbing hills, and I wish you'd let me go and see these hills. And the answer was, um, I don't know how many of you would know this in, in sort of geography of Peking, have you tried climbing a hill called Cove Hill? Cove Hill is, in the English, it's motion in Chinese, it is an artificial mound just behind the Forbidden City. It is approximately 75 feet high. <laughs> um, at least, and the other thing was I hadn't climbed it, uh, but at least you could tell that people had a, a, a sense of humor. We've traveled a long way between then and now. And it has not all been plain sailing by, by any means. Um, next time I went back to, to Hong Kong was as political advisor to a previous governor, Sir Murray McLehose, who became Lord McLehose, um, a, a very great governor. And the day that uh, Natasha and I and our two children arrived in Hong Kong, there was a traffic jam. And um, I asked our driver what it was. And the answer was, well, it's um, a police demonstration. And I thought, well, you know, police demonstrations, this must be normal in present Hong Kong. What was happening was that the uh, inter inter uh, Independent Commission Against Corruption had been so active that it had burrowed down into the depths of the police force and there was a reaction and the police were demonstrating against the uh, Independent Commission Against Corruption and it was a very unusual occasion. But normally Hong Kong was very, very orderly, it even was on that occasion. Uh, but it was a place which quintessentially, to use the title of a book from those days, was living on a borrowed place, borrowed time. The consciousness of 1997, the end of the lease of the new territories, the majority of the land mass of Hong Kong, that was there the whole time at the back of people's minds. There was a shadow of, of 1997. It was very difficult to deal with that issue of 1997. I, at one point in my career, I did some research on the 1920s, writing a PhD, and I came across papers in the old colonial office in about 1927, saying um, there's only uh, 52 years for the lease to run. It's high time we dealt with this, um, and naturally enough, it was in the pending tray. Equally, if you raise it at all, as we did quite often with, with the Chinese government in the contacts we had, which were limited, they would say, no, time is not right for dealing with this. But as the shadow came closer and closer, it became more and more essential to deal with the issue. Because if it wasn't dealt with, we all assumed that by, well, we within the government assumed that by the middle of the 1980s, Confidence would run down, nobody would know if they would own property in the new territories after the 1st of July 1997. Investment would go, disturbances would arise, the situation would become very, very difficult indeed. We were fortunate, Hong Kong was fortunate, I think the world is fortunate, that Chairman Mao 
died in 1976. The so-called Gang of Four, the people who had driven the Cultural Revolution and the extremist group, were disgraced later that year. Not long after it, Deng Xiaoping came back from disgrace, and the whole complexion of China began to change and created a situation in which it was at last possible to deal with the issue of the future. The, the first official visit by a governor of Hong Kong to Communist China was in 1979, Sir Murray MacLeod, and I was lucky enough to be able to accompany him. And we raised with Deng Xiaoping uh, the issue of the, the lease. And we, we, we put forward a, a solution. Uh, that's rather uh, uh, naively optimistic. We said, this is an issue which has got to be tackled. Uh, we all accept that in the long run, the sovereignty belongs to China, but uh, we think that for the moment, it may not be to your advantage, China or the people of Hong Kong, to change the status quo. We suggest that we should simply extend the land leases of individual plots in the new territories, which all expired, three days before the 1st of July 1997, we should extend it without a specific limit. We could only do it, it had to, we would have to have legislation in, in London, we could only do it if we had the tacit agreement of the Chinese. Um, it didn't work. Uh, about three months later, we, we got a, a, a very sharp response saying no, um, in no uncertain terms. But then we led on to the negotiations, which were, were not easy. They got off to a, a, a very difficult start. Um, it was a, a, a difficult time for, uh, for, for Britain. It was a difficult time, I think, for Margaret Thatcher. She had just been victorious in the Falkland Islands. She hated the idea of any uh, transfer of British territory to anybody, let alone a, a communist China. Um, it was long period of negotiations, which personally I only got involved uh, right at the end, and actually the team which was negotiating the text. There had been discussions at a time when I wasn't involved back in London, and then there had to be a team negotiating on both sides the actual written text of the agreement, and that was two long months in the, in the hot summer of, 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 of Peking. And it produced a very remarkable document, which is that, um, I can't expect you to see it from that distance, but that is the, the joint declaration on, on the future of Hong Kong between the British and the Chinese governments. It is, I think, uh, historically, probably one of the most remarkable documents in international relations. It's got uh, a broad statement of principles that sovereignty will be transferred back to, to the People's Republic of China, and then it's got an elaboration in, in uh, appendices which lay down in every key field of Hong Kong activity what will happen for 50 years after July 1997. So Hong Kong will be governed by Hong Kong people themselves, Hong Kong Chinese, not people from mainland China, not a governor sent in from the mainland. Hong Kong will have its own currency. The currency will be freely convertible for 50 years, no matter what crisis hits the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong has, well, has no authority to impose currency restrictions, and Hong Kong keeps its own Hong Kong dollar. Uh, education is under the control of the Hong Kong government. Uh, everything in terms of uh, international connections, which are not state-related, are under the control of the, of the Hong Kong government. Aviation is under the control of the Hong Kong government unless it involves uh, uh, moving from Hong Kong on to mainland China. Um, all of this is laid down in this very, very remarkable document. And as it has transpired, one terribly important section is the law um, for maintaining confidence, particularly commercial confidence, that has been crucial. It lays down that the existing system of law, which is the English common law system, will continue, that the method of uh, selecting and, above all, uh, getting rid of judges will go on as before, with one slight change that uh, the very senior judges are approved by the Legislative Council, but the legal system remains as it was. The Court of Final Appeal, which is in Hong Kong, 
uh, can have on it and does have on it now uh, one foreign judge uh, for, for, for any particular case, and they rotate between judges selected from the UK, Australia, New Zealand, but it can be any common law jurisdiction. So it's remarkable in its content. What I think makes it very remarkable as a historical document is that this is all, if you think of it, 13 years before it actually comes into effect. And that's why I can think of no parallel in history whereby it has been lay down in detail what happens to a piece of territory 13 years after the agreement is, is, is reached. Now, that didn't resolve everything. Clearly, um, there you were, it had an agreement, but 13 years to run. Uh, and during that period of 13 years, I went back myself as, uh, as governor, as the penultimate governor, the person whose potential book title, I was the penultimate governor of Hong Kong, does not have the ring of Chris Patton's, I was the last governor of Hong Kong. <laughs> so I never read a book. I can't find a good title. But throughout the whole of the period that, that, that I, I was there, we had this continuing problem. People said when they first in Hong Kong saw this agreement, and I, I, I went to Hong Kong the night my predecessor, Sir Edward Dude, and, and I answered it in the detail, they said, it's, it's unbelievable. It's too good. You can't trust the Chinese, it, Chinese Communist Party. It won't happen. And that was a predominant theme, I think, th throughout the, the time I was there. I don't think it was a single day went by where nobody said to me, how can you assure us that this agreement's going to, to work? What could one say? You could say what I actually believe, which is that the Chinese government had an extremely good reputation of sticking to international agreements. Not their domestic policies, those flip-flopped all over the place. Uh, but their international agreements, they had a very, very good reputation. I believed they would stick to it. They wouldn't have gone to all the trouble unless they were going to. Uh, it had implications for them on how they dealt with Taiwan, keeping to this, this agreement. So my own belief was that, that they would stick to it. But the predominant belief, I think it's fair to say, was skepticism on my bookshelves, and there is a line of books about that long, uh, which were written just before the transfer of sovereignty in 1997. I looked at them because I had to give a, a talk ten years after the transfer. The titles were The End of Hong Kong, Hong Kong British Betrayal, Hong Chinese Victory, Hong Kong Deserted, etc., etc., etc. There was one positive title, and it was called Constructing Hong Kong. And I looked into the fly sheet, and it was built, it, it was um, produced by the Hong Kong construction industry. <laughs> but that, that was the only optimistic one. So, take that pessimism. What actually has happened since the 1st of July 1997? Well, leave aside, first of all, the autumn of 1997, because Hong Kong was hit by the Asian financial crisis and, and hit badly by the Asian financial crisis. But it was nothing to do with the transfer of sovereignty. Um, it started elsewhere and it, it was stronger elsewhere than Hong Kong. And in fact, I think it actually helped Asia to readjust a lot of its uh, banking structure uh, to weather the present storm far better than, than the rest of us did. The actual transfer was remarkably smooth. The last few years had not been easy. There were uh, continuous rows between Hong Kong government and, and uh, mainland China and the government. Uh, there were uh, changes made in Hong Kong, particularly in the Legislative Council, which had not been agreed with China. And China said, uh, we won't recognize these changes. We will go back to what was agreed before. But given all these rows, what really is remarkable is how smooth the changeover was. I mean, just take examples uh, and remember what these rows were like, and, and uh, many of them in, in involved my successor, Chris Patton, who was unable to go. After his first visit to China, the year he took over, he was unable to go again, and contacts were broken. But nevertheless, what we were trying to achieve all along, which was continuity in the administration happened so that the chief secretary, that's a senior civil servant who had worked for him, uh, stayed in place. The financial secretary, Donald Young, stayed in place. The financial secretary, I mean, one of the 
the strangest things to me, the financial secretary was offered and accepted a British knighthood two days before the transfer of sovereignty. Uh, he can't use it, can't use the letters, because he uh, has to be a Chinese citizen, but he was offered a knighthood and accepted it. Nevertheless, not only did he stay on as financial secretary, he is now the chief executive of Hong Kong, so approved by, by the Chinese government. And the same right down through the civil service, and the only changes were, as we'd agreed before, that the very senior posts would be held by Hong Kong Chinese, chief secretary, the financial secretary, the commissioner of police. So expatriates would not be in those posts, but expatriates could be in other posts and were in 1997 are now that continuity. And I think the, um, the only other thing I would, I would really sort of pick on is the lack of, of, of changes. If one goes to India, for instance, uh, you will see the change of street names. You will see, or you won't see, all the colonial statues have been removed and, and put somewhere, either in a rubbish dump or, or, or the back of some park. If you go to Hong Kong, you will find not a single street name has changed. Uh, none of the statues have been moved, the ones that commemorate the founder of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, huge statue of Queen Victoria in Victoria Park, she is still there. Um, even a remarkable street, um, which is called Red Maxella Street, is still there. And for those of you who are very, very quick thinking and can transfer the European system of reading left to right to a Chinese system of reading right to left, you will discover that that is Alexander put up the wrong way around by a Chinese painter a long time ago. <laughs> That has not changed. No one, no one has resolved that, that problem. <laughs> Even the main barracks, the, the army barracks, the uh, military headquarters, which of course were transferred to the People's Liberation Army, uh, right in the center of Hong Kong, it was called Prince of Wales Building. The name Prince of Wales Building remained on it for oh, seven, eight years. It's now taken off, but on the shadowing of the building where the letters were, you can still quite clearly see Prince of Wales building. Um, and incidentally, because it was one of the great fears that the People's Liberation Army would simply march in and, and take over, they do not appear on the streets. They literally don't appear at all. Never in uniform, I don't think actually even out of uniform do they, do, do they appear. They, they stay in, in their barracks. So the transfer itself, I think, has been remarkably successful. All these things lay down in that agreement. The freely convertible currency, that's there, it has to be there. The legal system, as I was saying, is there, and enormously important educational system remains independent. And the educational system, how it has developed is, is quite extraordinary. I said Hong Kong University, um, you could not put it in top-ranking universities of the world when I was a student. But now, Hong Kong University ranks in some of the, the lists as the best university in China as a whole. So mainland China and Hong Kong, above Peking University, above Tsinghua University, above Jiaochong University in Shanghai, which are all great, great universities. Hong Kong University has risen up to that level. And a number, about four of the other Hong Kong universities, are right up. In, in the top ranks of, of Asian universities. So education has improved I I enormously. And the economy is doing extremely well. Um, it is because of China. China has been so dynamic as an economy that that spins over into Hong Kong. Hong Kong's role as an entrepreneur is um, enhanced in that way. All that Hong Kong provides as service industries uh, flourish a, a, as a result. Without mainland China flourishing like that, Hong Kong certainly wouldn't flourish, but Hong China does flourish, and Hong Kong, as a result, economically flourishes too. I mean, perhaps I could just take some of, some of the facts, so one can recite rows of facts. The population, I said, was 3.5 million when I went there. It's now 7 million. Uh, what is that? So nearly 2 million more than we are in Scotland. It's got the busiest cargo airport in the world, the second busiest air, uh, passenger airport. Uh, the airport, uh, incidentally, has received 40 awards as the world's best airport. 
Uh, it's a major financial center. It's the world's 11th largest trading economy as a territory. And for years and years, it's been rated as the world's freest economy in which to do business. All of that, as I say, that success is dependent on China being successful. So let me flip over then to, to, to mainland China, because that matters in, in all of this, this story. And, and you could, uh, statistics appear to go mad when you talk about, about China. So let me just sort of use some of them. 1.37 billion, a fifth of the world's population. Over 30 years of uninterrupted growth, averaging 10% a year. Overtook Japan last year to be the world's second largest economy. Look at the cities and massive skyscrapers, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, all the major cities. More than 160 cities with a population of over 1 million people. And fascinating statistic to me, 115 dollar billionaires, which is 11% of the world's total and second only to the United States. And that is the place which I first went to in 1963 in the depths of rather gloomy poverty. Or we'll, we'll take its intellectual world, the university, it's about 6 million new students each year, and that's up from a million each year in 1998. About 30% of those, incidentally, are, are engineers, and we have roughly 7% engineers in the UK. The second largest publisher of research in the world, the Royal Society, Royal Society of London, estimates that they will take, overtake the United States in this in, by about 2013. And interestingly, many students, of course, studying abroad, um, including 95,000 here in the UK, some of those from, from, from Hong Kong. But... And this is really why I, I have those two photographs, which incidentally are, are both, this is not an attempt to contrast Hong Kong with mainland China, they're, they're both Hong Kong. It has massive areas of, of, of poverty. I mean, the sort of poverty, that's not real poverty, but China, mainland China, has very, very large areas of poverty in, in, in the interior. There are 500 million people who live on less than $1 a day. There are 200 million migrant workers coming into the cities. You think of what happened in Scotland in the 19th century and the masses of people pouring out of the Western Highlands into Glasgow and how that developed Glasgow but, but produced terrible, terrible social problems and magnify that in, in, in China. 13% of its population over the age of 60 and a one-child policy and think of the sociological implications of all that and by 2050, over 30% of the population will be over 60. So, you know, huge problems building up. Those statistics just show you, I think, by themselves, that that cannot happen without a very dramatic change in the relationship of, of, of China to the world. A closed, a self-closed China, when I first went there in, in, in 1963, a very, very different China now. And another sort of just one of these statistics, I say you can become boggled by the statistics in China, but the number of Chinese who travel abroad, let me take those. From 1949 until 1973, so 30 years, it is reckoned, or it is roughly known, that in the whole of that period, 280,000 Chinese from the mainland of China traveled abroad. In 2010, last year, 57.4 million traveled abroad. And this year, it is expected that 66 million people from mainland China will travel abroad. Now, just think of that colossal contrast. And you, you see it often in, 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 in the UK. I remember when we were in, in, in Cambridge, um, Cambridge University. The, the language most spoken on the streets of Cambridge, as far as I could tell, apart from a certain amount of English, uh, was Chinese. A uh, huge number of, of visitors and, and of students. Now, all of this means that it's not people just traveling, but it's the strength of China's economic development, which inevitably means it has an impact on the world. It means it's projecting, like it or not, and sometimes it doesn't, doesn't like it. It's worried about doing it. There is a projection of, of Chinese power abroad. 
A bit of it that we see very clearly at the moment, I think, is a scrambling for resources. Massive Chinese investment in bits of Africa where there are raw materials, um, oil, whatever it might be. Similar investment in, in Australia for raw materials. South America, similar investment. Now, the largest trading partner of Brazil, having overtaken the United States last year. And not surprisingly, this has reverberations. It has a mixture of countries wanting Chinese investment, as indeed we do. We go out and try and get it. And countries which become alarmed by the extent of Chinese investment and potential Chinese uh, domination of their own economies. However much China may not wish to do that, it's simply trying to assure itself of the raw materials it's going to need for the next 10, 20, 30 years as its economy continues to boom. The other bit, of course, is China wanting to assure itself of security of supply. Again, if you sort of look at the map and, and take, for instance, oil, um, you see the significance to, to China of the Malacca Straits off, off Singapore, this narrow area which, through which all the shipping has to be channeled. And I think one can see why China is trying to develop uh, port facilities elsewhere where there may be direct land links into China. There's one, uh, for instance, in West Pakistan, in Baluchistan, the port of Gwadar, where China has put in massive investments and a potential, although it's a, it's a horrendous journey in a way, of using that port for shipping oil from the Middle East and then using the Karakoram Highway to transport oil into, into western, western China. And similar attempts that, that are bound to be, and you see signs of it already, uh, to find facilities I I in Burma or to find facilities elsewhere in, in Southeast Asia. The other fascinating thing to me is this sort of search for security of supply that for the first time, for a very long time, there was a Chinese naval presence, um, for instance, off the Horn of Africa, off Somaliland, with the pirate problem. Now, interestingly enough, um, there has not been a Chinese government, or naval presence, if you like, um, since the expeditions of an imperial eunuch called Zheng He, in the Ming Dynasty in the early 15th century. For whole of that period until recently, there has not been a Chinese naval presence off, off the coast of Africa. There is now. With all this goes a very substantial increase in a military budget. And not surprisingly, this causes concern around the whole area uh, bordering on China um, and concern elsewhere, the United States. There are a number of unresolved territorial issues round China, particularly in the South China Seas. The Chinese claim is right to the south of the South China Sea, and therefore all those little islands, which are also claimed by Vietnam, some by the Philippines, some by Indonesia. So there is a great potential for, for problems there. And there is a, a worry, um, alarm would be putting it too strongly, but I think serious worry, for instance, in India, about the massive growth of, of Chinese military power. There was recently an article by a, a retired Indian general who compared the military budget of China at some 95 uh, billion US dollars, actually the real figure is probably about 150 billion US dollars, with India's military budget of 32 billion. And he said, quote, how can we compete? Well, of course you can't. The, the, the discrepancy is, is enormous. And, and the other area of, of massive Chinese involvement is uh, financial, and particularly in the United States, where a very large part of the U.S. Um, bond debt, some $17 trillion, uh, is owned by China, and that is some 70% of China's reserves. I sort of tend to give up at trillions, I must admit, but it's, it's quite a lot of money. I think that then raises the, the sort of last issue I wanted to touch on, which is how, how, how should we, how do we, how should we react to this sort of situation? Um, China will be a world power, and China is a very significant power now, to some extent unwillingly being pulled into all sorts of international issues. They would, I think, often rather 
uh, keep out of them, not get involved. They want to develop their economy, they want to build up their access to raw materials without all the difficulty that you get when you uh, are involved in trying to resolve problems in the world. We, I think, need to encourage China to become involved. Uh, in some cases, that has been quite successful. North Korea is a very good example where China has played actually a very positive role. But it needs to be done much more. Need to bring China into the financial institutions like the IMF, increasing both China's contribution and with it its, its voting power. But I think we also need to remember and recognize that these world institutions that we want China to take part in were designed in what you might always call a pre-China world. I mean, it was the world of the Western world, uh, of North America and, and of Europe, in which China was not a participating player. And I don't think we can just expect that China will very easily and happily join the clubs which have been set up by other people with rules that maybe they don't particularly like. And in other words, if that is true, we must be prepared, I suggest, to adjust, because uh, only in that way can we get China fully to participate, and only in that way can we manage this enormous rise of, of China as, as a world power. And we must, I believe, engage with China at, at all levels, at government at all levels, discussion of all issues, quite a lot of this goes on. But much more than that, it's, it's um, personal uh, relationships, it's building up student exchanges, all the sort of network, the sort of cobweb of relationships that hold, really hold the world together. And, and we have to put uh, as much effort as we possibly can into that, both people from here, going to China and encouraging people from China to come to here in, into our own institutions. As far as Scotland is concerned, we are, we are a tiny, tiny player in all of this, but that doesn't mean we can't have some sort of role in it. Um, I think we need to put a great deal of effort into learning more about China. There are very encouraging initiatives, I find them very encouraging initiatives, in, in Scottish schools for the learning of Chinese. Um, I remember being extremely struck last year by going to um, the Perth High School, and literally half of the students at Perth High School were learning Chinese. Now, they, you know, they, weren't, they were never going to, you know, some of them might be, but most of them would never be brilliant classical Chinese scholars, but they would be exposed to China, they would know something about the language, something about the culture, and some of them would become inspired to get involved with China. That, that I think, is very encouraging, and it's, it's something that can be done in the sort of smaller scale of, of Scotland, which is perhaps harder <coughs> on the scale of the whole of the United Kingdom. And we need to build up our personal links and our intellectual links with, with, with China. And finally, because it's both Hong Kong and mainland China I wanted to reflect on, Hong Kong, uh, we shouldn't forget it. Uh, there was a slight tendency in 1997 to say, right, the Union flag has come down, it is no longer administered by Britain, it's, it's not a place of interest to, to people to go to work. That's totally wrong, and I think most people realize it. It's a place of enormous opportunity. It's a wonderful place for young people to go if they are prepared to work really hard uh, and I hope to get an understanding of the culture and the place and they do get an opportunity to play pretty hard as well but it is a terrific place of opportunity but finally I warn you that there are two bad statistics about Hong Kong Hong Kong has nearly two mobile phones per head of population, man, woman, child, 1.89 to be precise. So there is a cacophony in Hong Kong which is almost unbelievable. Uh, and lastly, and I'm sure this applies to the audiences here uh, and fellows of the Royal Society, the homes for billionaires in Hong Kong are the most expensive in the world. It costs you £6,700 per square foot, compared with London, which is only £3,000 per square foot. 
So it is, if you are a billionaire, it is moderately expensive to go to Hong Kong. Otherwise, it's a great place to go. Thank you very much. And, and now I would very happily take, take questions or comments if there are any. There's our, our usual roving microphone. So um, if you would like to ask a question, do please put it up your hand. Yes. And, uh, about five days back, the gentleman's hand up. Yeah. I worked in Hong Kong during 11 years, which encompassed your um, period there, Lord Wilson. I'm particularly interested in your comment about the 50 year business. Um, surely it's already time to be looking forward to how to make that transition, what has been put in hand about that, and also with such rapid rate of change, how are our predictions going to be able to hope to imagine, visualize what the change, the gap to be bridged, or the, the, the transition to be made is going to be. No, it's, it's a fascinating point. It, it was going through my mind very much when I was referring to uh, people in the colonial office in the 1920s looking at and saying well, there's only this, this number of years till the end of the lease. Uh, I think the short answer is nobody is thinking about it at all yet. Uh, and in a way that is perhaps not surprising because uh, what's happening is China, mainland China, is changing so fast uh, that the distinction between mainland China and, and uh, Hong Kong is, is becoming less all the time. And I think it's, in addition to that, in the too difficult box for the moment. And I would guess that it will remain in the too difficult pending box for at least another 20 years. Um, now, maybe behind the scenes there will be people who do start thinking, probably there will, um, but I don't think it will come up to the, to the top of any sort of serious uh, agenda for about, about another 20 years. But it, it, you know, it's worth thinking of how, how one does it. I mean, for what it's worth, my own hope is that it will be shown that the Hong Kong experiment is, is, is very successful and that part of the success, no, a huge part of the success is the difference between Hong Kong and mainland China, particularly its currency and its legal system. May, I think the educational one will begin to, to sort of fuss over as education in, in mainland China becomes, you know, just so good um, that that won't be such a sort of big issue. But I do think the law, unless and until, and it will happen, that the law in mainland China becomes uh, effective and uh, a sort of straightforward, not politically influenced, when that happens, of course, then the, the, the law thing changes too. But the convertible currency too remains quite important. But not yet, I think, is the answer. Now, yes, and then, and then front ground. Uh, I'd be as you know, that my nine-month-old granddaughter is going to uh, Mandarin classes in London. <laughs> but my question is, is the government of China managing to impose Mandarin or produce a national language? Um, I think she should be quite encouraged. Nine months old, how much Chinese is she learning at nine months old? <laughs> Anyhow, so if you take that for granted, she's clearly highly intelligent. Um, they, they have been pretty successful. Um, if you take the age group under, I think now probably under about 40, Anybody who has been educated even at primary school level around most of China will be able to speak some, some, some reasonable Mandarin. There are places where it simply <clears throat> doesn't happen. Um, some years ago I went on what was the first British mountaineering expedition in, in, in China since the communists took over, which was to climb the mountain called Mount Konga near Kashgar. And I was sort of attached because all these whiz kid um, Himalayan climbers felt they needed somebody who wasn't a whiz kid Himalayan climber but who did speak Chinese. Uh, the problem was amongst the, the indigenous Tajiks and Uyghurs and Kazakhs, they didn't speak one single word of, Chi of Mandarin Chinese. So um, visiting their yurts, I was just as much about at a loss and using sign language as anybody else. But you know, leave that aside, the heartland of China, young people all, all now speak Mandarin. Interestingly, of course, Hong Kong, which, as I said, when I, when I first went there as a student, 
virtually nobody who was Cantonese spoke speak Mandarin. Uh, now all the young people do speak speak Mandarin, and, and their shops they'll, they'll, they'll speak Mandarin. There was a, 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 an extraordinary period um, in Hong Kong. Actually, when I was first there as a student, uh, where the Hong Kong government would not teach Mandarin in the schools, the government schools of Hong Kong. Why? People might listen to Radio Peking. Now, if you'd ever listened to Radio Peking in those days, you would not have been won over by Radio Peking. It was as dull as ditch water. But that, that was the policy. But of course, that, I mean, that's completely changed. Yes, I mean, uh, down the front, 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 General Secretary's wife who must get precedence. Do you think that the West's obsession since 9-11 with Islam and Al-Qaeda has interfered, will or has interfered with our ability to react and perceive what is happening with Chinese expansionism in places like Africa, etc.? There's a, there's a very interesting point there. Uh, I'm not sure if it sort of influenced things like attitudes to China's, China's expansion. I think I mean I think the Chinese expansion is is a commercial expansion rather than a, than a political. It's not a Cold War type expansion that sort of thing. I think where, where it has um, affected things is in Chinese Central Asia. Uh, China has a, a tremendous problem with the ethnic minorities there, uh, and uh, a very substantial part of those ethnic minorities are Muslim. The problem they see is that this is subversion against uh, rule um, from, from, from Peking. Uh, arguably, people are, let's, let's, let's say rather than people, the United States would be less, become less concerned about those issues because the quid pro quo for them is that there would be Chinese support for uh, things to deal with Islamic extremism elsewhere. So there's a sort of trade-off off there, but I don't, I don't think it does, it does affect elsewhere like attitudes towards what's happening in Africa. No. Yes, so, okay. so and then I'll come back to the front. Do you see Chinese challenging English as a world language? Actually, it's, 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 it's a very interesting thought. Um, I don't think so, because English is now so deeply embedded around the world. Um, the number of people in China who, who speak English is, is, is enormous now. Um, and so it is, it is certainly, I should think, is and will stay for some time at least the lingua franca of, of commerce around the world. And the other bit of it is, although the number of people who speak Chinese because the number of Chinese is, is large and the economic power of China will be significant. Uh, it is not probably the simplest language in the world. Um, it's probably, I don't think it is quite so hard as uh, those of us who study Chinese perhaps you know, pretend. You know, there, is, there is an attempt to almost say, well, uh, you know, anybody who's learned Chinese must be absolutely brilliant, you know, phenomenal. But it's not actually that hard. But it's not, it's not one of the simpler languages. And characters, of course, make it harder to, to transmit. Because you've got to, I mean, if you're using a computer, um, you have to put it into a phonetic. Um, and then the, the, the phonetic will, will identify the character and, the, and you transmit it like that. Um, so it, it's, it's not a terribly simple language for, for a highly technological age. Um, no, I don't, I don't think it will supplant English in, in the short term. Yes, uh, yeah, and then sorry, we, uh, let's take that one because your microphone's there and then come to the third row. Thank you. Um, when you visit Hong Kong and China, it's uh, hard not to be impressed by the phenomenal amount of development that's taken place, and it really is quite spectacular. But of course, it's been done at a tremendous cost to the environment, uh, not only in China, but worldwide, because of their rapacious consumption of resources. Uh, I think this is beginning to be recognized now, but I just wondered if you'd like to reflect on some of that and your um, views as to how much you think that actually twigged uh, the, the problems they face and how they're going to deal with them. Maybe concentrate on some of that water, for example. Mm. Um, it, it is a colossal problem. Uh, 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 a Hong Kong Chinese friend brought me recently um, one of these aerial surveys, um, or maybe quite a satellite actually, of southern China, the Pearl River Delta, so going roughly Canton, Guangzhou, down to Hong Kong. And it was one of those maps that showed built up area in red and, and open land in green. 
the whole way from Canton, Guangzhou, 90 kilometers down to Hong Kong, was just one line of red, uh, and that's all development in the last 20 years. The largest green space was in Hong Kong. Unbelievably, Hong Kong, half of it is country park, and this shows up on, on the satellite. Yeah, so it's a colossal problem, um, and the use of resources is, is huge. Uh, it is right to say that China is paying a lot of attention now to, to issues of this sort, uh, both of water pollution and that sort of thing, environmental pollution, um, and attempts to find better energy sources. And they do, uh, some of their sort of coal-fired power stations are, are appalling in terms of, uh, of the sort of smoke that they produce and, and the uh, noxious things putting into the atmosphere. But they, they are trying to concentrate on it. One of the hardest things is that um, we say to them, look, uh, you've got to worry about this. Um, we've got this global warming problem, and it, it, it needs all of us to um, reduce the amount of, of fuels and things we're using. And whether they say it or not, they certainly think it. Uh, you have been doing this for the last 150 years, and you have been exhausting all these resources. You have been polluting the atmosphere. We are now trying to develop our economy. We have massive poverty, and you are saying to us, don't work so hard to get your people out of poverty. I mean, there's that sort of emotion behind it. But um, I, you know, I think the bigger one is that increasingly the Chinese governments are concerned with these issues, and, and one, just, uh, one hopes that they will put the resources into it. But they will want to do it not at the expense of, of producing uh, jobs for a large number of people who are coming every year onto the job market and trying to change the balance uh, of massive poverty in interior China to uh, comparative wealth on the coast. They're going to have to deal with that. Yeah, and then we'll take the same row and then lay it at the back. What is happening on the enormously long border with Russia, for a start? And secondly, what about the innumerable small countries in the Pacific? How, what's happening there? The border with, with Russia, um, so far as anything that comes to me uh, has it, is quiet. I mean, those conflicts that there were on the Asuri and the Amur River sort of way back, um, which were, you know, really quite serious. Those have not been happening. I, I'm not aware of any military clashes on that border for, for a long time. There are still one or two unresolved issues, but they're actually quite minor on that border. It's, it's where, where is the, uh, the main line of the, of the river flowing on which island. So they're, they're actually pretty small. So there are not big issues there at the moment. And, and you said in the South Pacific, um, South Pacific, I don't, um, there is Chinese involvement with the various um, nation states in the South Pacific, South Pacific Islands, but nothing of any dramatic significance. Uh, it's the South China Seas that is the problem area uh, with these disputed territories, uh, and that, that is potentially really quite, quite serious. Um, because, as I was mentioning, the Chinese map includes the whole of the South China Sea as, as being Chinese, and there have been uh, a significant number of issues in that area recently, um, and that is something that's going to need very, very... Um, or I can of uh, chasing away uh, fishing boats sort of nearer to Hainan Island in, in waters which are not indisputably Chinese, uh, this usually involves Chinese Coast Guard services rather, I believe, than the Navy. But increasingly, there will be a Chinese naval presence there as they build up their navy. You know, they, ha they have an aircraft carrier now, uh, and they will build more. So, you know, that is an area of potential conflict. And we'll need great care. Um, there was a lady in the back. Yes. Would you like to say something about human rights in mainland China in the context of the recent case of the artist Ai Weiwei, where they seem to have created a public relations disaster, and one wonders why they, why they behave like that and why they handle it so badly. Um, there is a considerable clumsiness, often, in the way that the Chinese authorities deal with, with cases like, like this, and uh, a pretty tough attitude towards dissent. 
uh, absolutely no doubt about that. So in terms of sort of human rights as, as we would tend to see them, uh, the level is very much lower than we would think would be acceptable in Western Europe. If you're looking at it from the point of view of the Chinese government, you're looking at the difficulty of the governance of a country of that enormous size, uh, disparate uh, dialects, disparate economic circumstances, and still in, in, a, in a process of development where the leadership of the country are worried, almost frightened, above all things, in chaos. They have lived through the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, and they do not want to see that happening again. And that, that I think, is understandable. The other understandable thing is, given where China is now, the huge problem it faces, the wish to develop and get a more pluralistic society gradually. But um, it has to be said that the way these things are handled is often very, I would say, unnecessarily clumsy. And that, I think, is, is, is a pity in absolute terms. It's actually a pity in terms of, of China's, or the perception of, of China but by, by other, other countries. But I do think saying that one also has to sort of feed in a, an understanding of the background to the sort of issues a Chinese government has to face. Not easy. Can I take one, one, one more question and then I think I fear I should let people go. Yes, no, no. Thank you, yeah. I'll take, take two more, I'll take yourself, sir, and then uh, at, at the back, three rows from the back. This is not so much a question, uh, Lord Wilson. You gave some inter interesting statistics about property for the super duper super rich, um, comparing London and Hong Kong. Uh, for the average Hong Konger, it's pretty much the same situation. Um, all departments in mid levels are currently on the market at between. 10,000 and 15,000 Hong Kong dollars a square foot. Mm. That means a thousand square foot apartment which is small is a million pounds. Mm. That is in an old building in a relatively lower middle class area. Mm. Once you go to the more modern buildings, you're looking at twice that. Um, the new territory village houses, which you will no doubt remember, which were intended to give every new territory indigenous inhabitant a house, and, of course, being Chinese, they took the plots that were given and developed them to the full so that everyone was identical. A three-story building, um, 700 square foot per floor. These are now on the market in excess of £1 million. Yeah. Um, now, the whole world has faced a property collapse over the past few years, but there is absolutely no hint of that in, yeah. any, as in any area of Hong Kong's housing yeah. um, strategy, yeah. causing the sort of problems that we have here. Young people can't get on the housing ladder and so on. I don't know if you have any thoughts as to why it is that the Hong Kong property market is immune from the forces affecting property markets everywhere else, including mm. Singapore. Mm. Um, so it's not simply a question of size. There must mm. be some other factor at mm. work here. Mm. Okay. No, I mean, it's extremely good points. So all, all, all of that, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very serious social, social problem. That, 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 that's, the, that's the first thing. And it is a serious economic problem in, in the risk of a bubble. I think action is being taken to try to curb the, the percentage of, of bank lending so that uh, the bubble, if it bursts, and, and, and sooner or later, I think it, it's, it's bound to, uh, won't be catastrophic. The, one of the factors that's going into this, is, as clearly you know it very well, um, is the amount of housing being built up, being built up, being bought by people from mainland China. Uh, and sometimes that is purely as an investment. It, it, it's money being filtered out of mainland China, put into property as, as an investment. And that, you know, creates its own buoyancy. But, you know, as we all know, bubbles don't go on forever. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a very big problem. And it has, yes, and we take the last question, which was over the moon. Thank you. And my question is very simple. And as for you, is China a friend or an enemy, an angel or a dragon? Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so here we go. If I, if... And as for in your opinion, yeah. is China a friend or an enemy, an angel or a dragon? I think you, sir, know that Chinese dragons are really rather benevolent creatures, don't you? 
Chinese dragons bring rain. Chinese dragons are really good things. No, that's not really answering your question. Um, China, I, I think it is wrong ever, unless you've really got to uh, categorize anybody a, a, as, as an enemy. You should treat them as a potential friend and make sure that they, they are a friend. If you treat somebody as a potential enemy, they will become an enemy, and that, that's dangerous. So if I had a philosophy, it is um, when in doubt, treat as a potential friend and hope and work hard to make sure that they become a real friend. Thank you very much. <laughs>
for 50 years of regulated rule in the transfer of Hong Kong to China. It represents about 0.5% of the volume of material which the Royal Society of Edinburgh has to describe its government's arrangements. <laughs> We have, we have an enormous amount to learn from this. This is a little treasure. So, um, but I think I want to end by saying that one of the, the strands which come through from knowing Lord Wilson uh, uh, as you get to know him is that he is an incredibly warm person. He loves talking to people He's very welcoming when people come as guests from any part of the world, or from Scotland, Edinburgh, even Glasgow, um, <laughs> to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. He just is extremely warm. And what he said about, and in answer to questions, about the future and our relationships with China were based around you should never lose touch with the, the personal interactions that you have with people that you might think are not on your side because they, to welcome them as friends means that they come on your side. If you don't do that, you have more difficulties. This approach that he has to the personal links with people is vital to the way in which he operates and I hope that I can do that to some limited extent. So that's the end of the proceedings. Um, I wish you a safe journey home. and. Just a round of applause of, and thanks to, to Roger.